Welcome back everyone to this lecture here in Cultural Anthropology. Today we're looking at week three and the specific focus of this week, as you know from reading the text, is on research meth methods in anthropology. We'll look at three themes this week. One is methods and talk about the different types of methods out there, notably participant observation. We'll talk about this distinction between the familiar and the strange, and we'll discuss the importance of ethics in research. This is really one of those topics where I think you can get super excited about anthropology because using methods, and that includes everything from doing interviews in field settings, doing participant observation, using a survey, doing historical analysis, or doing archival work, allows you really this theme here to discover the world on your own. And I think this is particularly important in this day and age in which people doubt science, in which people spread conspiracy theories on social media. In this era of COVID-19, we know that a lot of unfortunate life has been lost due to the mistrust of science and the mistrust of our medical professionals. Um, in fact, medical professionals right now are dealing with some of the greatest stresses out there because of the fact that they're not just dealing with putting their lives in line as frontline workers and responders dealing with this medical crisis that is a global pandemic, but also dealing with the disinformation the aggression, people protesting outside medical offices. And so I think at this moment in our history, we can really talk about the value of science and the value of using methods to discover the world on your own. It's so much easier, unfortunately, to simply go onto social media and to look at what someone posts and to not verify the information being presented. So one of the things we can talk about this week is how to combat this by approaching things as social scientists approach things using this process of science. So I have a few charts here to look at, and this is an example of how science differs from religion, from politics, from ideology, from the stuff you read and see on social media. You'll notice in all these diagrams that everything is cyclical. In fact, if you Google science or science as a cyclical process, you see charts that always have a circle. And the circle is really key because what the circle suggests to us is that it's not a simple matter of going from point A to point B and finding an answer and being satisfied with it. Because science is cyclical in nature, it means that the loop or the cycle, the circle, is never closed. There's always a possibility, as you see on this chart here, of going in and finding more information. The idea of revision, having a theory and a hypothesis, choosing a research method, looking at a specific population, doing all this analysis, uh, this is always happening in a cycle. You go back and you modify your hypothesis that you've created, which is your notion, if you will, behind your research that suggests that you have an idea about something in the world, some empirical phenomenon. Empirical means you observe it with your senses. This is, again, very different than what happens on social media. After 9-11, great example of this, there were conspiracy videos like Loose Change that had no founding in reality, no founding in science, no founding in empirical observation, but it was someone's hunch. There must be a conspiracy. And so one of the things you, you may remember if, if as we're here at the 20-year anniversary of that unfortunate uh, set of terrorist attacks is that people would take information out of context. So following 9-11, people on the street were interviewed by various news crews. Hundreds, if not thousands of people were interviewed. So some people said, when I heard the plane um, hitting one of the two towers, whichever tower they're talking about, it sounded like a missile. So what people in Loose Change and, and these other conspiracy theory videos did was to take those out of context, plop them all in a video, and were to assume then that somehow because a number of people thought they heard a missile, that indeed um, it was an inside job and planes never hit the um, any of the buildings, the Pentagon or outside of Pennsylvania or the Trade Center. Uh, there were actors, um, people were unloaded off these planes when they landed in Ohio, and missiles actually hit some of the buildings, and then maybe somehow video was altered such that it looked like an airplane. If it sounds ridiculous, it absolutely is. And I think this is what we face as a nation when we exist in this um, ethos or this, this collective feeling or paranoia of assuming that, you know, 9-11 was an inside job and that because a few people said missiles hit the various buildings, we come to the conclusion that missiles hit the buildings. 
The problem with that is you see none of these processes here, the cyclical process of science, is followed when someone makes a conspiracy video. They take things out of context, they put things together, all the unfounded accusations of there being computer chips inside vaccines in this day and age really is showing you how dangerous an anti-science attitude can be to public health and to mental health as well. So as you think about these current contexts, I really recommend thinking about science and think about how it offers opportunities to view the world in ways that are not present in other realms, including social media. Again, the fact that there's a circle here really tells you the process of science is never finished. You're always gathering new information and trying to revise your hypotheses. If you read folks like Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, a very famous book, he talks about the process of normal science and this idea that you reject current views of things over time. It's just like Ptolemy and Copernicus talking about the sun versus the earth being the center of the solar system. Over time, you make revisions and you discover that your earlier assumptions were incorrect. That's one key difference. The people that make these conspiracy videos or that you know purport that there's a big conspiracy to put computer chips in our bodies via the COVID-19 vaccines never engage in any of this. They engage in paranoia, they engage in hype, they engage in nothing that remotely looks like science. Now I realize when you're going on social media, you're not purporting to do scientific research. The problem is a lot of us get information from social media and as a result, we may be influenced by paranoia, processes, and conspir conspiratorial forms of thought that have no basis in reality yet impact people's social, psychological, personal, and political decisions in the world. Um, and that's the real threat of the time in which we exist when we throw science and medical and technological advances aside for conspiracies and hype and paranoia that has no grounding in reality and is really part of a paranoid complex that probably reflects some deep psychological harms when you think about how people use conspiracy theories uh, to give meaning to their lives. Um, super sad. And we're not saying by this that science is some sort of religion that you adopt, but science is a process and an approach and a way of seeing the world that offers us incredible possibilities. Now, there are alternatives to scientific research, and I took this from a book called Social Science Research Methods. There's the idea of authority, so your parents tell you to do something. Media myths, this is what we're talking about with social media. People believe things because of what's in the media. Common sense, you know, you just do what you do because it, it makes common sense. Tradition, or even personal experience. And we won't delve into these in any depth, but they all have real fundamental flaws. One of the real bad ones is common sense. Um, sometimes you hear people making decisions about various things, including, let's say, gender issues, which we'll talk about in the next coming weeks. And they say, well, it's just kind of common sense. Boys will be boys and girls will be girls. When we understand culture and the fact that everything is constructed in our cultural worlds, we really should challenge this notion that somehow there's a common sense that can, be that can be applied to all everyday matters. And this is again why we like to rely on science, at least those of us working as social scientists. We all rely on these other aspects of tradition, common sense, personal experience, media myths, and authority. It's not bad, but again, if you're making a decision to take or not take a vaccine or to wear or not wear a mask, based upon common sense, experience, what the media tells you or doesn't tell you, authority, people in your family saying, it's gonna be okay, COVID-19 isn't a big deal. If you get sick, you'll, you'll come right out of it. Um, at this point in time, here in October of 2021, it's killed more people than the Spanish flu of 1918. So we really do need to question, again, how a lot of these influences that have no grounding in science are impacting our public health, our mental health, and so forth. When we talk about research context and social sciences, we really want to clarify that the way that you approach things in social science, again, radically differs from other forms of understanding. So you could look at how an issue gets debated on a TV show or in a bar or coffee shop. A lot of emotion. People are not citing sources, of course, when they're arguing about you know sports facts in a bar, who's the best quarterback of all time. Uh, same thing on talk radio or TV, the emphasis on rhetoric on performance, on hype, because you want ratings. 
In a scientific setting, and academic settings, in classrooms, conferences, there's less focus on rhetoric and the winning of the argument and more on the process, that cyclical process of science. The uses of research, citation of sources, expression of the foundations of the issue and an understanding of the positionality and context of the researchers and the research itself so we can look for any forms of bias as we'll talk about today. We often would say with science, we take an idea almost from Zen mysticism. We approach it with what Suzuki says is a beginner's mind. There are many possibilities. In an expert's mind, there are few. And so what we say is we hopefully withhold judgment until we gather more information and assess other perspectives. Again, the folks that made conspiracy documentaries about 9-11 didn't do this. They didn't look for alternative explanations for a phenomena that seemed to be odd or out of the ordinary. Instead, they jumped to their own conclusions. Many of the people who made those videos had no knowledge of engineering, of structural physics, of physics in general in terms of airplanes and explosions. And so they used kind of their folk myths and their own, quote, common sense to come to conclusions that are purely laughable and, again, have no basis in reality or any form of scientific thought. And that's the danger of this is they don't approach it with a beginner's mind. They have their minds made up, just like the folks in talk radio or social media, and then they promote an idea and it becomes more and more dangerous because that idea influences people, not through its veracity, its facts, its scientific basis, but through its rhetoric and its emotion. And if you go back and read Aristotle's rhetoric, he talks about if you really want to convince an audience, use your emotions, use rhetoric, and try to convince people based upon their background. So if you're talking to younger people and they have particular interests, stress certain issues. Conservative politicians in the United States do this all the time with older people. They tell them, even though they're perfectly safe, they say, you're going to be victim of street crime or gun violence, or vote for me and I'll get tough on crime even though there's no basis, again, in reality for those people feeling danger. It's rhetoric, it's hype and emotion that's pushing a political, ideological agenda, whether that's a conspiracy theory or uh, a politician trying to get elected or stay elected. Now, when you look at understanding in different fields, in math, you know, there might be a, quote, right or wrong answer, x plus 1 equals 7, x equals 6. There's a sense of something definitive, and it's a bounded field. In social science, if we ask, how is a culture's perception of magic constructed? It's really not as easy as saying there's a definitive answer. We're talking about multiplicities of perspective, of culture, politics, per perception, and subjectivity, and we'll get into the etic and emic distinction in a second. And we realize that what we're studying is contextual and constructed in terms of the field of study. This is an example here, if we're trying to study something like the video game Grand Theft Auto, which I used to use, it's an old game now, we could talk about how the academic version is different from the popular version. So if someone in, in the news media was talking about Grand Theft Auto, they might talk about it in a very reductionistic sense. They might give personal anecdotes about it, and they might not be able to contextualize the knowledge that they're expressing. In academic research, we look at complexity, and multifaceted sides of things. We use our context of research and our contextualization of knowledge, and we try to maybe apply it to some practical matter in the world. Like if we're concerned about video game violence, we could have a conversation with people and communities about video game violence. So what we do is we review literature, we conduct contextual and interpretive analyses of the game. It could include playing the game. We could detail the symbols, narratives, and context of it. I've done this in my own research, studying video game uh, violence and video game guns uh, for some uh, work on looking at the relationship of video games and the military and violence in everyday life. We study everyday aspects of it. So as a participant observer, you would go to video game conferences, conventions, you would go on to Twitch and other famous boards online where you could view people playing games and you do content analysis. You would interview people. You would look at what they're saying and doing during the playing of the game. You would apply theories and various analytics. We'll talk about some of this later as we talk about research thematics. You would po participate in fo focus groups and public events, synthesize it, attend conferences, and revise what you're working on, present your findings at conferences, publish them in academic journals and books that are peer-reviewed. And peer review, by the way, 
is another sign of this that contrasts with conspiracy theories. If you watch um, documentaries about flat earthers, as an example, they confirm what the other person is saying and they have their own communities, but that's not the same thing as peer research or peer review. Peer review means in trusted journals and books, you have people who are experts in your field looking at what you've written about, what you've studied, giving you suggested revisions, you revise and you republish your work. So peer review is another key side of doing research in anthropology and the social sciences. Right now we can jump to what I'm calling perspective in anthropology, and I'll give you some highlights from our text this week. So very specifically, the book talks about this idea of making the strange familiar and the familiar strange, talking about Margaret Mead's work. And I talked about this in the last couple weeks in some of our lectures as well, so I won't spend as much time on this. But imagine... You go to study another culture, and initially you see a food practice or a way of eating or dining in that culture that seems really strange to you, and you have that feeling of culture shock, which is that feeling of apprehension that you're in a new place and something doesn't seem right to you, and it affects you mentally, physically, physiologically, and so forth. And we talked about how culture shock initially is a challenge, particularly for tourists, but over time, if you're being the anthropologist, you realize that culture shock can teach you something about the culture being studied. So over time, what initially seems strange to you in another culture seems a little more familiar. You get used to it. Uh, the example I gave was when I was teaching in London and I got used to not driving a car. I came back home and then I was very much going into the familiar of the past. Driving a car in the States seemed very strange to me. And indeed, the result of this dichotomous relationship of the familiar and the strange is that when we come home to our home culture, it probably seems a lot stranger to us, even though it once seemed familiar, because we participated in another culture and we see their way of doing things using cultural relativism is just as valid as our way of doing things, but different. So it really offers opportunity to think about the shifting nature of these two dichotomous opposites, the familiar and the strange, and how it can inform us about a culture our own biases, and certainly get us to question our own uh, culture that we have back home if we're anthropologists coming back home. Um, now, there's a very famous uh, story, if you will, or exercise called Body Ritual Among the Nasarima. And this is a famous piece by Horace Minor, and it's sort of giving away things, and, and they give this away. What they used to do in the old days of anthropology, of undergrads, they would pass out this assignment to you. You'd read this short article, and you can click on it right here in our book, by the way, if you want to read a copy. And you would read it, and you would say, wow, this is very strange. These people are very strange. They describe putting um, objects in their mouths and swishing those objects around their teeth, basically describing a toothbrush. Well, sort of the punchline or the secret of it, kind of like an M. Night Shyamalan movie, and maybe like some of the not great M. Night Shyamalan movies, where the reveal, if you will, isn't that amazing or it seems a little corny or kitschy. Indeed, Miner's essay is this sort of this uh, type of essay where you feel like, okay, I get it. It's just American spelled backwards. And I kind of wish they didn't mention that in the essay because they do give away the ending um, of the movie or of the text in this case. But it's just another opportunity to see something that seems familiar to us, like brushing our teeth and all the other rituals described by Miner are indeed exotic if you put them kind of in this different context by not revealing what the culture is and not describing too carefully what the strange practices are. So it's it's another opportunity to talk about the strange and the familiar. And that's kind of a fun one. Now, another aspect of perspectives in anthropology refers to the um, etic and emic perspectives. And this comes from phonetic and phonemic. And you can look up what those terms mean in linguistics. They refer to different sounds and possibilities of expressing sounds and connecting that to units of meaning and language. What we use it for in anthropology is almost a heuristic or teaching device to say that if you're doing thick description like Clifford Geertz talks about in his influential book from 73, The Interpretation of Cultures, you're indeed looking at the nuances of culture and how people subjectively experience and understand the world. The anthropologist wants to go in and try to understand through thick description, really understanding what's happening in that culture, how the people in that culture see it, 
and not how the anthropologist from presumably maybe another culture sees it. And thus we coin the etic and emic distinction. The emic is the perspective inside the culture of how people see things like a particular religious ritual versus the etic perspective is you the anthropologist coming in doing understanding thick description as Geertz talks about and trying to do enough research and writing and field note taking and field research such that you can express this to other people out there through that storytelling method that we talked about going back here uh, a couple weeks in our earlier readings. Now, with this distinction being made, the Attic and the Emic, some anthropologists have said it's a little too pat in that it sort of suggests there's always an inside and an outside. For someone who exists in a culture that they're studying, like me, studying my own culture and working in an organization in the theme park industry and writing about it, the Attic and the Emic, you know, I, it may not be the best distinction to always use, but it's a quick shorthand that we can use in context of talking about culture and the interpretations of those cultures by the anthropologist. So just be familiar with the two perspectives and realize that indeed they are not always the best to be applied in every situation. Like anything else we learn in this class, going back to our discussion of culture over the last couple of weeks, saying that culture itself is a complex concept and indeed in some cases may not even be defensible as a concept that makes sense anymore in our world. Um, now, I, I wrote this piece some time ago called The Value of Research. And in this particular piece, I was really interested in the idea of sharing with colleagues in the world of design how they can use research in their own perspectives in their own situations. I just pulled up the article here. So my idea behind this was to not present this for people reading anthropological work or academic work, but everyday people who wanted to learn from research approaches taken by anthropologists to apply these in their own design context. As I said here, anthropologists strive to gain an insider's perspective of the environment. So this is me at Epcot doing some research, sitting down here writing in my field notes. Um, again, I'm in a very simulated environment. Um, it could look like maybe an environment of another culture somewhere out there, but it's not. It's a simulation. And these are field notes or field books that we use to collect information about a culture or um, a place of study and its people. I talk about the three D's of research, the determine the nature of your research, document it, and detail your findings to other audiences. And we'll come back to that at the end when I pose to you four questions about how you would do your own research here at the end of this lecture. Now I did a visit to a couple places, the Starbucks Roastery, in Seattle, Washington, since I study popular places. And I talked a little bit about using my audio recorder, my Blackmagic camera, my GoPro, how I approached it using uh, media as a tool of, of understanding and documenting. I also visited to an Ikea store and I talk about taking maps and looking at the layout of the Ikea store and trying to understand it in an anthropological sense. I talk about when you do research, you could do things like drawing maps. You can list actions, events, and happenings you observe. Notate all this and your own observations in a notebook. Do you see any overarching themes? Uh, for example, in the IKEA store or the Starbucks, how are things laid out? How do they express the brand? How does luxury get connoted in this very high-end version of Starbucks in Seattle? You could also remember to take um, pictures, videos, audio recordings. Again, diagrams can help you illustrate events or situations and collect any materials. So if I'm going to Ikea or the Starbucks store, the roastery in Seattle, any of the brochures I can get, I collect. I did this at a Patagonia store in Portland where I really wanted to look at issues of social justice and how Patagonia commu communicates social justice in their literature. So I asked for any information that the folks in the store had and they were very happy to pass this along. And indeed that became part of a future chapter I wrote on social justice and consumer spaces. And then I talk about informal research. And this is not like being the professional anthropologist and taking detailed notes and even videos. It's just walking around and trying to understand what's going on. And so I talk about informal research using looking, understanding, analyzing, rearranging research and presenting it. And they also talk about some helpful tips about seeing research as a form of dialogue approaching with an open mind, which goes back to the uh, Suzuki statement about Zen beginner's mind, as opposed to talk radio mind or social media mind. Document more rather in less detail in case you need it. I mentioned here my Flickr account 
I think it's closer to 60 or 70,000 images. It might seem excessive, but I might need these images to express something later. In a publication like this one where I used this photo and I didn't know I was going to be using this photo, or even in a presentation at an academic conference in a PowerPoint, let's say. As much as possible, share and collaborate. We'll talk about collaboration with researchers in a bit. And consider the best ways to apply your findings such that your results may have practical or applied outcomes. So that's another thing we'll be highlighting here. So I'm really highlighting some key themes that I'm actually covering with you in this lecture. And it kind of just shows you that I'm really committed to this in terms of doing my own research understandings. Now we should also address ethics and research. It's super important. Um, there's the issue of human subjects review and consent. So a lot of big universities across the world have a human research board or human consent board or an IRB, Institutional Research Board or Review Board. What they do is they look at the ethical and legal aspects of research. In case something happens and confidentiality is broken or some other situation uh, takes place, people need to know that uh, they're not going to get sued and that there isn't going to be harm coming of any of the people, animals, projects, information that's being handled. Um, so ethics and research, it's key to anything you do in social science. Any class you take in social science, you'll talk about this. In fact, here's an example from the very controversial work of the sociologist Laud Humphreys. Laud Humphreys was, was studying um, in, impersonal sex in so-called tea rooms. And these were uh, public restrooms where men would have trysts or have sex with other men. And so he was very interested in studying this phenomenon to try to understand who were the people that were partaking in these secret sexual liaisons in these somewhat public places, although hidden from public view. So he came up with different strategies, and one of the most controversial strategies was he, um, as, as you can see here, he took notes. Um, he actually was masquerading himself as a voyeur. So indeed, he wasn't letting anyone know what he was doing. He didn't get consent. So what he did was he would get the license plate numbers of these men who were having sex in these restrooms secretly. And he actually um, had a friend somehow who could track down the address of these individuals. And then he, um, under false pretenses, went to their homes to try to discover who they were. And again, didn't give any inkling that he was doing research of this nature. And to this day, it's considered maybe the most controversial form of research ever done in the social sciences. Again, it happened in the mid 60s, would never happen today. Um, the proposal itself, as, as this article talks about, was only reviewed by his PhD committee. And other researchers found out about it after the fact. A fear arose, and uh, there were even uh, fistfights among members of the department. I shouldn't laugh at that, but it just shows you how crazy this research was. And as you can see here, this, this quote talks a little bit about that controversy and, and what took place. So I always like to give that example because it reminds us that when we do any kind of research, we always have to think about the ethical components of what we're doing. We could never do anything like Humphreys did in today's day and age because obviously that could result in super negative harm to the people being studied. And we say, if you think, well, it's gonna gather interesting information about why these men participate in these illicit sexual activities in public restrooms, um, you say, okay, well, that, that may be an interesting research question for you, but it doesn't mean that you're gonna bring harm to the people involved and potentially put the university at risk for a lawsuit. Who knows what else? I mean, it almost sounds like something that could have had criminal prosecution in terms of the invasion of privacy of the people involved. So looking back on Humphrey's research, we realize it was very wrongheaded and very problematic at so many levels. Since those days, because we have institutional review boards and human subjects reviews requirements, we hopefully will not be getting away with any of that kind of research. You can see the AAA, go to the website uh, under the readings, has very detailed information about how to handle ethical situations. Seven examples here of what to do and what not to do. Do no harm, be open and honest, obtain informed consent and permissions, weigh ethical obligations, make your results accessible, protect and preserve your records, maintain respectful and ethical professional relationships. You can see most of, the, most of those were violated, and granted this is the AAA and not the ASA or American Sociological Association, but Humphreys obviously would have failed most of these in terms of this particular ethical code. And every organization you'll meet or learn about will have its different ethics codes. So the ASA, the AAA, 
political science and psychological associations all have various ethical codes. And believe me, you learn about this heavily in your social science classes because it is such a, a problematic issue as you saw with the case of Humphreys in sociology. Now, and, and there's there's dress shirts uh, being advertised here. I always think it's strange what happens when you when you read news. I m- might have been shopping for shirts at the time, but in any case, uh, this is a story from from USA Today talking about this controversial human terrain system program, where anthropologists were embedded with the military in situations in Afghanistan. And after this happened, the AAA was really concerned about it and the program ended. But I thought it'd be a good discussion today to think about during this week what you might do or what you might say about whether the HTS program should have happened or not. So we can really talk about this this week as we consider ethics and anthropology. Now, you can watch some famous films like We Live in Public, which was a surveillance experiment, if you will, that was eventually shut down by the police. I believe this was in New York City. It's been years since I've seen this. 5,000 hours of footage and shot over 10 years. And a lot of people said that when this film this project and film came out, it was really unethical because it's definitely something that you you wouldn't necessarily want to engage in either as a participant or a researcher. I really recommend, it's a pretty old film from 2009, that you check this film out because I think it's, think it's an example of something in the world of pop culture that is unethical even though it doesn't presume to have like a social science or research bent to it. Now, you probably heard about the very controversial program of uh, Facebook where they were data mining information, uh, thinking it was this fun psychological study. So if you want more information about that, check this out. Pretty old study. A lot of people said it had some impact on the presidential elections, and it also um, had an impact on how we think about sharing information in social media. We realize that social media is constantly mining, doing what we call data mining, gathering information from us, what we like, what we buy. And actually, that example of the shirts is a great example of this. So they're tracking everything that we buy or luck out or look at, and as a result, they're basically intruding in our lives, yet there's no IRB or human subjects review or consent that we're necessarily given to the company, other than maybe when we sign up, we click a little thing that we don't read that says, you give away all your rights to privacy and information and ownership of any data and uh, any content shared on on social media. Something to think about, and, and it's really resulted in some people leaving social media because the feeling is that social media is unethically doing things that social scientists would hopefully know better not to do in terms of human subjects review and these kinds of issues. Now I encourage you in the additional readings for this week, we won't go over these, look at all these unethical human subjects review examples or research examples and you can see exactly what was done you can see why these uh, forms of research were unethical and get more insights, including about some of the ones we talked about here with Humphreys and also the Facebook uh, case. Okay, so let's go on to now what I what I call research thematics. And thematics are just a set of themes that allow you to think about things in, in some new ways. So I'm just going to go through these and talk about them briefly, hopefully to highlight some concerns or content. Uh, concerns for this week and also maybe pique your interest about some issues. So of course we're talking about field work and one of the exciting things about doing field work is that you get to go and discover the world on your own. These are just selfie stills of me from my various videos that I do all over the world and this literally has Germany, Singapore, Italy, all sorts of different research sites I've been to. And as I'll talk about later, in these videos, I'm really trying to present my research to a wider audience, not to an academic audience, at least in my current stage of research. Not unlike what I talked about in that short article called The Value of Research, which again, I really recommend you take a look at this week. Now, we all take field notes in field settings. This is from our textbook. It says, field notes are indispensable when conducting ethnographic research. Although the taking of notes is time consuming, they form primary record of one's observations. Generally speaking, ethnographers write two kinds of notes, field notes and personal reflections, and then they go through what these involve. So this is again me in a field setting, and when I have my notebooks, I'm also doing I'm 
doing things not just like writing, but highlighting, making charts, even using graphics to help organize thematics of that research itself. In today's day and age, you might actually be using a cell phone or a smart device, a audio recorder, to actually record your observations because it can, as the book mentions, be very time consuming. I think there is a value to writing down notes because those notes can be looked at and revised and worked on over time. Um, always make sure to have a backup copy of your notes. There's a, a famous story about an anthropologist named Leach who lost all his field notes in a tsunami in um, a particular place that he was doing research in. So, you know, today's day and age, do the redundancy and backup thing, save your notes, make digital copies, save those offsite in the cloud somewhere, and uh, do the same thing with your audio and video recordings because it's, it's a big deal when you lose uh, valuable field notes. That could be years of work and research gone down the tubes. Now, I mentioned this before, this is a group of us of Canadian, German, and American researchers doing collaboration, going to Disney, and looking at issues, and we're pointing to the very famous uh, sign that you see at Disneyland, here you leave today and enter the world of yesterday, tomorrow, and fantasy. Um, and this particular group was interested in what we call temporality studies in theme parks, so this sign had significance for the fact that it uh, spoke to time and how time is used in various ways in theme parks. Now this is another uh, theme park research group involving Swiss, German, and Spanish, and other field researchers. And we talk about the idea of interdisciplinarity. So this means that when interdisciplinarity occurs, people from different disciplines, sociology, anthropology, performance studies come together and research something. So I'm trying to give you an indication that you shouldn't think of it as only anthropologists hang out and talk to other anthropologists at conferences. Doesn't uh, happen like that. In fact, we engage with wide research communities. In this particular example, we're looking at the Telecon um, ride, which is a kind of famous ride at Fantasia Land in Germany. And we're kind of pointing at it and people are talking about it because different people saw it in different ways. I would look at it, and I was taking the picture here, as an anthropologist in terms of how maybe uh, Mayan cultures are being appropriated, as we talked about with cultural appropriation. Other researchers were interested in the staging or theatricality of how the space was blocked out with lighting, with smoke, with various effects, with participation of the audience uh, among the the writers here in terms of the theatricality of it. So every discipline that comes to study a particular research project or issue or context has a different approach and thus we really recommend what we call interdisciplinarity which is a co-mingling of ideas or concepts, theories, approaches and methods from people of a wide range of disciplines not just anthropology. Now, curiosity is also good. So if you look at Borofsky's um, interview uh, with famous anthropologists here who studied um, uh, on the East Coast uh, crack houses and drug culture, just that excitement of understanding anthropology, I think, is something you can get out of this class and a sense of real curiosity. You want to understand the world. It's curious to you. How do you understand that world? And we'll talk about that at the end of this PowerPoint. Now, I should say that some aspects of doing research are kind of sexy or exciting, and some are less sexy and less exciting. So a lot of what we do, of course, involves field settings. So if I go to Las Vegas, I collect all the various magazines and handouts and brochures, kino cards, and I maybe bring this home. I have some notes. I even sometimes will write notes on the back of a kino slip. And then again, I try to create an assemblage of the notes, of the graphic representations, and I do a lot of this often with um, colored paper, um, you know, cutouts, gluing things, giant boards, and so forth. But a lot of that is very mundane. And so I just want to emphasize, it's like Indiana Jones, if you watch that movie about a famous archaeologist, which talk about violating cultural principles of archaeology and no harm and leaving no trace. I mean, he was a looter, basically, and yet he was celebrated as this great archaeologist. Well, th that's great in the movies when you actually do an archaeological dig like I did years ago as an undergrad. There's a lot of time-consuming stuff where you're cataloging artifacts and pot shirts, bits of pottery. You are writing all this down in detailed um, entries that's used for the archival process. Yet we think it's always sexy and it's always action and engagement and you're, you're getting into dangerous situations. It's really very often not that case. Um, some of my research might have been going through file, filing cabinets where I was working and looking at ride outlines and writing about ride outlines. So it's, it's really not always incredibly, you know, 
crazy impressive and, and immersive when, when you're engaged in the research. Now, I think the application of research is something for us to talk about this week. So I'm, I'm here giving a, um, a presentation on my work at Astroworld from a ritual, if you will, that we participated in as employees and trainers in Germany. And I often think to myself, okay, so my application, my research might be presentations and publications, but does that make a difference in the world? Now, some would say that not all research is applied, and we'll talk about applied anthropology throughout this class, which is applying your research to something practical in the world, maybe for bettering the situation of whatever it is that you're studying, the lives of the people, the environment, animals, other species, whatever. Not all research has to have an applied aspect to it, but I'm suggesting to you this week, it's one thing to think about if you do your own research. Do you want to do applied research or more theoretical research? Now, research can also be controversial. Laud Humphrey's extreme example of controversial research. There are many other examples out there. I was talking about some time ago in a lecture about how even doing pop culture, say, in the world of anthropology can be controversial. And I talked about it in this short piece in Anthropology News back in 2009. And uh, it's just interesting that certain subjects are seen as legitimate objects of study and others aren't. So if you go on to graduate school, when you look at your programs that you might want to enter as a graduate student in anthropology, definitely think about the research agendas of the folks teaching there, the professors, the researchers. Go to the website of the anthropology program that you're thinking of applying to and look at the research that they do. If everyone there is doing historical anthropology in traditional indigenous societies and you have this great project on American popular subcultures, maybe punk studying punk subcultures in the United States, you probably want to ask, well, will these people be open to that kind of research? Will I even get into the program? And if I do, will they encourage me to change my project? And it was something that I felt very comfortable doing at Rice University because there isn't a limitation coming into the program about the nature of the research that you do. But not all anthropology programs are the same, and there are many traditionalist programs out there. So I don't want to give you the wrong impression that you have this great idea. It's cutting edge. It's innovative that it's always going to be accepted for publication, for research admission, if you're applying to a program to do a particular project and work with particular faculty. So something very important to think about because of course nobody is perfect and just because we do scientific research doesn't mean that people's emotions and biases and perspectives and ideologies come into the fray of affecting the anthropology department that you might be interested in applying to. So controversy is an interesting side of this, as is access. So if you sign a non-disclosure agreement, as I had to doing some consultation with a media company years back, I ironically, as I say here, can never write about that research. You don't always have access to the thing you want to research. Laud Humphreys, in his wrong-handed research, should have figured this out. He didn't. He wanted to do it. And we see the result. Super unethical research that really negatively impacted the lives of many people in academia and outside of academia. So access to your research is not always a guarantee. And aspects of control or no control are also something to consider. So really check out my um, piece from a reader I did some time ago called Research in Themed and Immersive Spaces. What I do in this piece is talk about lack of control that sometimes takes place in a field setting when things get entropic, when you can't study something, as I talked about here, me getting kicked out of a space. It's happened to me on two occasions, actually both were in shopping malls, where I got kicked out by security and told I, I had to cease uh, uh, collecting video and still photography. So you think, well, it's a public setting, I can go in there, take whatever I want. Not necessarily. So in some cases, you'll be kicked out or told you can't do the research you want to do. So that control or lack of control that you may experience in doing research in the social sciences and anthropology, I think is something really key to think about as you do your own work. Now, research is also site dependent. So again, every site brings its own dynamics or issues to the, the play, to the table when you're trying to do research. Again, if it's a public setting like a casino, you can't walk around interviewing people playing table games. You can't take photos and videos of the pit area in casinos. So again, access, control, lack of control, being able to collect what you want to collect in a space of research may or may not happen because of various issues related to trade secrets or politics, or um, if it's a top secret place, you can't just go to area uh, 51 and say, I want to do research here, right? So the site itself will often determine the type of research that you do. 
whether you can take video or not, whether you can take audio recordings, whether you can talk to people or not. I've run into issues in uh, some places of pop culture trying to interview people. Years ago when I was a graduate student, I tried passing surveys out at a place and I got someone got really upset with me and said, you know, you need to leave. And I kind of just took off because I thought I'm going to get in trouble if I continue to pass out these surveys. Um, and that particular time, it was not a successful survey run for me. I think I got 2% of those surveys back from this particular place of, of, of study in the state of Wisconsin. So, you know, the site itself will often determine the type of research you can or can't do. Now, I talk about research imaginary, so ways of conceiving of your research. This was for a project I did for the anthropology department at UC Irvine a couple years back before COVID. Um, and I was w working with a group of students, graduate students, and I was talking about how to frame research and to use sort of imaginaries to try to understand what they were doing. And I try to fr phrase this in terms of dichotomies, fiction and nonfiction, science and, uh, you know, more aesthetic approaches and so forth. And I was very interested in a theoretical model that the students could use to try to understand just how they imagine their research, how they visualize it, literally and figuratively, in terms of diagramming it, in terms of writing out on a piece of paper an outline of the research. So as you get involved in your own research, I really encourage you to think about the various ways of imagining it prior to doing it. One way of looking at that, I mentioned this handout to you last week, so I won't cover it again, but if you do ethnography, which is a written text about another culture that we write, which incidentally enough doesn't, I think, get enough coverage in the third chapter that we're reading. But you could think about the structure of that ethnography, the readership you intend, the field site, the voice that you use to write about it, um, also the perspective that you might apply to that research as you're working on it. So a lot of ways of doing this imagination. Now, we've talked earlier about the scientific process. Again, I refer to this handout, which is included in this week's work, just to give you a sense of how social science here, anthrosoc, history, and other disciplines differ from a natural science, which maybe is more laboratory-based. Psychology tends to be the one in the social sciences that has a huge lab component. I remember in my undergraduate psychology courses having to do experiments for extra credit for researchers, and we would sit and watch things flash on a screen and press a button, and never were told what the research was for, but it was one way for them to get research subjects that they needed for their study. And I always wanted, wanted to get you know insights about what was being studied, and they would say, no, we can't tell you that information, which was unfortunate. Um, now, doing field research as we're working in down here is really applying to what we do in anthropology. Ethics, NDAs, human subjects review, all that kind of stuff, and participant observation is really the stuff that we're getting into this week here talking about research. So definitely use this handout and think about the process of uh, science, but more generally how we look at research methods in um, anthropology and the social sciences. Now, the presentation of findings is really key. I talked about this last week as well. So if I want to reach a popular audience, maybe I do more YouTube videos, short videos, and I pre present my research in such a way that the folks listening to it, the viewers, don't think of it as research. I'm sort of hitting them over the head a little bit with research, but they don't realize it. So it's more sneaking up on them versus a presentation of my findings to an academic audience. If I'm writing for academics or presenting for academics, I have a totally different approach than I do if I'm working with a popular audience. As well, I do a lot of work with journalists who want to interview me about gender issues, about theme parks and theme spaces. When I present to them and give my ideas, I make sure to distill it for a more popular audience. So looking at the presentation of findings, as well as your audience, is really key to doing research and thinking about research. So something for us to talk about this week. Now, authority and reflexivity gets a little bit of context in the book. And strangely enough, they don't mention the book that launched a lot of this, which is Writing Culture. Um, and there's an interesting, I won't get into it here, but there's an interesting sort of perspective that you get in some of the chapters in terms of what they include and don't include in terms of what we call the postmodern approach in anthropology. The book has some flaws in that sense, just in terms of what they leave out and the uh, folks they don't talk about and the perspectives they, they don't talk about. So again, I was um, part of the program that um, some of the authors wrote. One of the key authors, George Marcus, one of the editors, was on my dissertation committee. So I have a lot of relationships to this book that is well over 25 years old. I actually wrote about some of those experiences in what's called postmodern anthropology. So be sure to check out my encyclopedia entry from this encyclopedia of social and cultural anthropology I worked on years ago with other authors. And be sure just
just to see what is meant by postmodernism. But when we talk about the authority of the ethnographic text and reflexivity, we're talking about decisions being made by anthropologists in writing about a particular culture and leaving details out or including only certain details for dramatic effect. Now, I've told you throughout this lecture that we try to work as social scientists, but social scientists, because they're critical and reflexive and part of that cyclical nature of science that we're talking about, we're also critical of our own assumptions and our biases, and we try to make those clear in doing, in today's day and age, what is called reflexive ethnography, or a form of writing in which you try to express very clearly what your biases are. So if you're studying gender in a particular culture, and you come from a particular gender background, that perspective, based on your gender background, could impact what you're writing about in your studies of the anthropology of gender. So thus, you be reflexive, you try to express what your ethnographic authority is, and you hopefully are open enough that readers of your work can understand any biases that may unfortunately creep in. You can also think about experimentalism. So just like natural scientists do experiments, we do this in the social sciences. This was that presentation I referred to at UC Irvine. And one of the things I wanted to do was to work through a series of photographs that I had prepared here and also projected on a screen. And then I wanted to incorporate um, live Eurorack music and sound experiment as part of this presentation. And so experimentalism is also something to think about in doing your own research. Now, we could think about transformation and change, and I was uh, giving a lecture years back on doing research in consumer culture in Germany at a university where I was a visiting professor of American studies in Mainz, Germany, the Johannes Gutenberg University there. And I presented this chart to them talking about how traditional research has changed over time. And I talk about all the issues, uh, access of the researcher, the evolution of the space is the space about the consumer. How do you document the research? Who's doing the research? How um, does the research occur? Who's complicit in, in doing the research? And so I was very interested in sort of going through this process and saying, here are some of the key issues that you might think about in doing research in consumer spaces. Again, the site-dependent nature or the content or context-dependent nature of research can often condition how you go about studying it, the theoretical apparatus that you apply to it, and even the perspectives that you take in terms of working with people, interviewing them, and so forth. As research changes over time, we change with it. So more and more of us are documenting things with audiovisual means. I encourage you to look at this techniques and handouts approach. I shared this with the group at UC Irvine. And I talked a little bit about using media in research, how you integrate it, your budget, your purpose, your time, and so forth. And so I encourage you to also look at this handout because it might give you some insights about how you can use audiovisual, even graphical means, even sonic means to do research in a, in a given space, whether it's a consumer space or otherwise. So check out that handout this week in our extra reading. Now we'll close today then just on your own research and I'll leave the question up to you. If you want to do your own research, ask these four questions. First off, what is the research you want to do? So what is the field site? How do you want to study it? Second is, why do you want to research that? What is it that inspired you to do this research? Maybe if you want to do something on gun control reform and you or a family member were victims of a violent um, attack with you know, a weapon or something, that's your inspiration to do the research to try to bring some public policy change to the table. The how is another question. So what will you do? Will you do surveys? Will you do ethnography? Will you do audiovisual work, etc.? So how will you do the research? And lastly, to what end? What is the application of your research? Do you want to write a book about it? Do you want to write for a popular audience for journal journalism purposes? Do you want to do something on social media? Do you want to eventually create a documentary film? Do you want to do presentations at academic conferences? Do you want to try to achieve some kind of social change? If you're doing gun control reform, maybe you want an actual policy change connected to the research that you're doing. So as we close this week three talking about research, I hope you'll get engaged in these issues, looking at different research methods, and by the way, go through the uh, textbook. I didn't go through every type of research method like surveys, life histories, archives. We talked a little bit about participant observation. You could cover that in the book on your own. But think about the different research methods. Think about um, the issue of ethics as we talked about with human subjects review and IRBs. And also importantly, think about these research thematics that I presented through much of my own work. And then in conclusion, if you do your own research, what is that going to look like? 
In this class, you'll do some miniature research projects working on three written assignments of a different, each of a different nature. But if you do research in the future, I really encourage you to think about some of the issues we talked about this week. This is one of the most important concepts or themes to understand in terms of methods in anthropology. And I hope, again, you'll use it for a little bit of intellectual self-defense, particularly as you deal with the fact that we live in these conspiratorial times in which social media more and more is influencing the way we think about the world. So thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with the week four lecture.